Hello, today I'll be talking about an approach to peripheral edema. To understand the optimal framework for characterizing the etiologies of edema, it will be helpful to very briefly review the relevant physiology. The development of edema is primarily governed by the Starling equation. The Starling equation describes how the net filtration rate of fluid across the capillary endothelium is dependent upon the balance between the capillary and interstitial hydrostatic pressures and the capillary and interstitial onchotic pressures. Of the six variables on the right side of the equation, three vary in a clinically meaningful way. First is the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is almost solely dependent upon venous pressure downstream from the capillary. The higher the hydrostatic pressure, the more fluid is squeezed out into the interstitial space. Second is the capillary oncotic pressure, which is largely de uh, determined by the concentration of the protein albumin in the blood. The higher the albumin, the less blood is squeezed out into the interstitial space. And the last one is the filtration coefficient. There are several factors that impact this value, but one of them is the overall permeability of the capillary endothelium. The more permeable or leaky the capillary is, the more fluid will leak out. Thus, this gives us three general physiologic categories of edema. Increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, decreased oncotic pressure due to hypoalbuminemia, and increased capillary permeability. A fourth category, which is not accounted for by the Starling equation, is when the drainage of the accumulating interstitial fluid is impaired by obstructive lymphatics. So now, let's check out the diagnostic framework and see where etiologies of edema fall. The first category, increased hydrostatic pressure, is the most diverse and actually contains three distinct subcategories. There is intravascular volume expansion, so pressure is higher because there is more fluid squeezed into the intravascular space. We see this in kidney failure, uh, in pregnancy, medication side effects, particularly with prednisone and NSAIDs, and with an acute salt load, though it's worth mentioning that an acute salt load is unlikely to cause significant edema in the absence of other contributing factors. The next uh, subcategory is venous obstruction and or venous insufficiency. In these etiologies, there is some physiologic or anatomic problem that is preventing blood from moving back to the left side of the heart. Starting at the left ventricle and incrementally moving closer to the capillaries, we have heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, cirrhosis on account of portal hypertension, a deep vein thrombosis, and a condition called chronic venous stasis, in which the primary abnormality is incompetence of valves in the veins that normally help ensure that venous blood moves in a distal to proximal direction. Regarding heart failure, it's worth noting that many affected patients will also have intravascular volume expansion. The last subcategory is arteriolar vasodilation. In this situation, there is a reduction in the pressure drop between the arteries and the capillaries, so even though arterial blood pressure decreases, capillary hydrostatic pressure might actually increase. This is the speculated mechanism behind the peripheral edema that can occur in patients on dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as philodipine and amlodipine. Now, okay, that was a packed category. The, the next one, decreased oncotic pressure, has three notable conditions. Malnutrition on account of decreased protein intake, Cirrhosis shows up here again on account of decreased protein synthesis and nephrotic syndrome on account of protein loss in the urine. Causes of increased capillary permeability are predominantly sepsis and cellulitis. The fourth category is edema due to lymphatic obstruction, which because it presents differently, differently uh, and is treated differently is given the special name lymphedema. In the United States, lymphedema is predominantly caused by malignancy, either from surgical lymph node dissection, from infiltration of lymphatics by a tumor itself, or from extrinsic compression of lymphatics by a tumor mass. In developing parts of the world, 
Another significant cause of lymphedema is filariasis, which is a chronic parasitic infection by roundworms living inside the lymphatics and which are endemic to the tropical parts of Central and South America, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Islands. And finally, there is a miscellaneous category for hypothyroidism, which is thought to be due to infiltration of the skin with glycosaminoglycans. In the developed world, the most common causes of acute edema are medication side effect, a DVT, and cellulitis. The most common causes of chronic edema are kidney failure, heart failure, cirrhosis, and chronic venostasis. When assessing a patient with edema, key questions to ask in the history include the duration of edema and its distribution, that is whether it's in the legs, arms, or both, or if it's generalized to include the entire body, which is a special case of edema called anasarca. If the edema is bilateral, it's important to know if it's symmetric or asymmetric. Ask about the presence of pain or redness of affected extremities, shortness of breath, abdominal distension that might indicate the concurrent presence of ascites, and symptoms of hypothyroidism. A history of cardiac, pulmonary, liver, or renal disease, including risk factors for each, is obviously very relevant. Take a good medication history, including over-the-counter meds, in the event of NSAID use. And ask about travel, considering in particular those areas of the world in which filariasis is endemic. Moving on from the history, always take the vitals. In addition to explaining anything that came out of the history, a focused physical exam should also include a characterization of the edema, specifically the observed distribution, symmetry, extent, and severity. Also assess whether the edema is pitting or non-pitting, meaning whether an indentation remains in the skin after you release following a few seconds of sustained pressure with your finger. As a general rule, lymphedema and hypothyroidism predominantly cause non-pitting edema, while every other condition I've mentioned predominantly causes pinning edema. Also look for erythema, warmth, and tenderness, which might suggest cellulitis or a DVT. Regarding the characterization of edema, it's almost ubiquitous to grade edema according to a four-point scale in which a clinician might say something like, the patient has three plus edema to the knees bilaterally. Please note, however, that there is absolutely zero standardization as to what this four-point scale refers. Some people use it to describe how far up the extremity the edema extends, while others use it to describe how far in it pits, and yet others use it to describe how long it stays, uh, takes the skin's contour to return to normal after pressure has been released. So if the severity of the edema is a critical feature of the patient's presentation, describe each aspect of it rather than attaching a meaningless number that will be uninterpretable to others. This includes getting a tape measure to measure the maximum circumference of an affected extremity. And if the severity of the edema is actually not particularly relevant, it's actually okay to just say mild, moderate, or severe. The remainder of the exam should include cardiac, pulmonary, and abdominal exams, as well as a general skin exam, looking for things such as evidence of chronic venostasis in the legs and signs of liver disease anywhere, such as spider angiomas. Key labs in working up edema include a chemistry panel looking for renal dysfunction, LFTs looking for hepatic dysfunction, a urinalysis looking for proteinuria, and plus or minus a CBC if cellulitis is suspected. Additional tests to consider, depending on preceding findings, include an echocardiogram, a right upper quadrant ultrasound, and a lower extremity duplex ultrasound. I'm going to divide up the diagnostic algorithm into two parts, depending on whether or not the edema is acute. And for this specific symptom, I'm defining acute as an onset in less than 72 hours. So if the onset was acute, consider whether it's unilateral or bilateral. The acute onset of bilateral edema is most often due to a medication side effect or a high sodium load in a patient with a chronic disease like heart or kidney failure that is already predisposing them to edema.
However, a bilateral DVT or a clot in the IVC is still possible. If the acute edema is unilateral or demonstrates significant asymmetry, you should evaluate the patient for a DVT. The first step with this is to use a clinical prediction rule called the WELL score. There are actually two WELL scores. The more commonly known one is the one for a pulmonary embolism, but there is a similar one for DVT. I'm not going to review the whole calculation, but you can easily look it up on the web. The WELL score will categorize a patient as having either a low or high clinical probability of a DVT. If low probability, check a serum D-dimer test. A normal D-dimer in a patient with a low clinical probability rules out a DVT and other causes should be considered. On the other hand, if either the clinical probability is high or the D-dimer is elevated, obtain a duplex ultrasound of the affected extremity. This test is also known as compression ultrasonography with Doppler. If the test is positive, a DVT has been ruled in. But if the test is negative, a DVT has not necessarily been ruled out. Guidelines recommend to consider a repeat ultrasound in one week, particularly if clinical suspicion remains high. Now, let's look at the patient whose edema has been present for greater than 72 hours. In this case, the next question is whether the edema is primarily pitting or non-pitting. If non-pitting, it's probably lymphedema, though hypothyroidism is still a possibility. If the edema is primarily pitting, is there a specific diagnosis suggested by history, focused exam, and basic labs? If yes, then just work up the relevant diagnosis. If there is not a specific diagnosis suggested yet, consider the albumin, presence or absence of proteinuria on UA, and whether the JVP is elevated or normal. If albumin is low, there is no significant proteinuria, and JVP is normal, consider working up liver disease based on your clinical suspicion and other lab tests with a right upper quadrant ultrasound, but also consider malnutrition. If albumin is low, but there is significant proteinuria on UA dipstick, quantify the proteinuria with a 24-hour urine collection and work up possible nephrotic syndrome. And if the albumin is normal or near normal, but JVP is elevated, check an echo to evaluate for heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. That's it for peripheral edema. Key takeaway points for this topic. Peripheral edema is caused by either excessive intravascular hydrostatic pressure, decreased intravascular oncotic pressure, increased capillary permeability, or impaired lymphatic drainage. The most common etiologies of acute edema are a DVT and cellulitis, both of which are typically unilateral, as well as medication side effect, which is typically bilateral. The most common etiologies of chronic bilateral edema are heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure, and chronic venous stasis. Lymphedema and hypothyroidism typically cause non-pitting edema, while all other etiologies typically cause pitting edema. The routine assessment of acute unilateral edema should focus primarily on the possibility of a DVT using the WELL score for DVT. And last, the routine assessment of chronic bilateral edema should include assessment of JVP, measurement of albumin, and a urinalysis.